she and my ex-boyfriend were like very... Which, which ex-boyfriend, sorry? You know which ex-boyfriend. You said seven years ago, right? You don't want to dox them online. <laughs> you, you want me to dox your ex-boyfriend <laughs> online? How all the girls you have data go and read them out, post their pictures online. I'll never want to travel the world alone. I'll never want to explore the world alone. So things that are experiential for me, I need to do with other people because I'm an extrovert. And if I experience it by myself, it's like I never experienced it. So hypothetical scenario. Yeah. Let's say you have a group of friends. One friend is extremely budget right now. Some of your friends have higher earning power now and they would like to experience more things. So who is supposed to like give in more? Should the friend with the less money budget more for the trip? Or should the richer ones like accommodate to the one with less money? Therefore, we want to encourage all of our friends to make more money. But again, money's not everything. But it's just that the private sector also gives you more time and space, better mental health. The miles are not worth the fees that you pay for it. If you want to mile hack in your country, you need to figure out how much a mile is worth. If you are a day trader, it's horrible to even try. Mm. Uh, it, it will ruin your trip or it will ruin your trade. <laughs> Something will be ruined, right? Not Me? day trade because it will ruin your trip or your <laughs> trade. Oh, that's good. Hi friends, welcome back to our series where Aaron and I enjoy snacks and dive into topics that we are passionate about like entrepreneurship, money, personal finance, trading and investing. Join us for a blend of light-hearted conversations and deep dives into things that fascinate us. Ranging from the philosophical to the technical and sometimes downright comical. <laughs> Think of this series as us inviting you into our homes to hang out with us, get comfortable, Grab a snack, no, grab a snack first, then get comfortable, <laughs> and let's get started with today's topic. Today, we are going to be talking about travel and finances, or traveling and money. Because we are going to spend the next month overseas. We'll cover things like how to budget when traveling, how to manage money when traveling, how to make the most of your travels, like how to stretch your dollar. We'll also talk about our travel styles. Right, and, and like there's some things that I personally do as well. Travel insurance as well. Everything related to money and travel, we will talk about in this video. Let's talk about our travel styles yep. first. So actually, my travel style is called extremely flexible because whether or not there's a very <laughs> fixed itinerary or it is completely unplanned, I'm okay with both. I've gone to trips where it's completely unplanned, no place to stay, I landed there and just hoped that my friend had a, had a place for me and had nothing else booked. And I've also gone for trips where every single thing is booked and planned out to the T, down Please to the me. minute. I'm okay with both. And to be honest, even if- Have a voice, have an open Whether loser. or not the itinerary, as long as my friends are there, usually we're having fun. Oh yeah, if, if the trip is extremely planned out, I will not have fun with my friends. I feel like I can have enough fun with them in Singapore. I don't need to travel with them to have fun. Mm -hmm. And also, I would rather not risk the friendship because I'm not as flexible as you. Right. I hate plans. And also, like, when it comes to money and things like that, it becomes very apparent when you travel how different your lifestyles are. And if you're not all aligned on that, you could there will always be some conflict. And when I was younger, I wouldn't say I experienced it, but I when I traveled with people who were older than me, some of my friends were older than me, and they were already working while I was a student, but see the disparity between the people with different careers and how they want to manage their money and... Right. Yeah. Maybe for you it's easier now because like... I just graduated, mm. all of my friends were all kind of in the same boat together. We all studied the same course, kind of... Mm -hmm. Most of them are all doing the same job. <clears throat> yeah. So we are all financially similar as well. Spending habits um, are also similar. Yeah. And so that makes it very, very easy. When I travel, I just want to spend time with my friends. And to me, that's more important. And so if I have friends who want to travel budget, I'll always travel budget. Because to me, being able to spend time with them is more important than, than like... I would say comfort. I will these, spend time with my friends in Singapore. These are the things that would make it memorable as well. I still remember like the times in, in grad trip as well. We actually booked this, I don't know, it's like this like tennis, this squash court place and it's just like a room with like 10 beds. Mm. Just all like check ourselves inside and there's no space and everything. Um, but we still had fun. And like those memories are, very, are just like very precious to me. Yeah. That was what made it exceptionally fun. That's also a lot more budget, right? Like your trip was a lot more budget. Yeah. You didn't spend that much money. As you grow older, it starts to become more and more expensive because we're more and more like in tune with the luxuries of life and no one wants to like travel and scoot for eight hours anymore. Trips become more and more expensive. So then if, to me, what matters is spending time with my friends, I'd rather spend the time, the time in Singapore where it's much cheaper. It was something to experience a different place and do things that I specifically like in those places. 
then I rather use my money on that instead of squeezing all of that in one. Right, so I, I was so a too. budget gal all the way till I started work and one of my best friends, most of my friends actually are a little bit older than me, like two to five years older than me. So they earn more than me. And ever since I started hanging out with them, my travel has gone from budget to middle, middle ground. I don't take budget anymore, but I also don't really take premium economy or business. I always take economy, but I'll always be a full carrier like SQ. For me, I don't stay in hostels ever. I, and I don't backpack at all. I backpacked once with an ex-boyfriend who really enjoyed backpacking. Uh-huh. And um... Which ex-boyfriend? <laughs> so I lost count. Oh. Know very well which ex-boyfriend. <clears throat> I'm just putting it out there, you have many ex-boyfriends. Red flag right here, don't even think about it. I'm glad that I experienced it, but will probably never want to do it again. It's not my thing. I like the spontaneity of it. So uh -huh. the way he backpacks is that he would book a one-way flight. They always fly to somewhere in Southeast Asia, like Philippines or Vietnam. He would not book accommodation, so we'll get there and then we'll be like, Oh, which hostel do we stay in now? walk in, see if they have a room, and then we'll only book the accommodation for like one or two days. And then whenever we feel like it, we'll fly to somewhere else, take a boat to somewhere else, because it's very cheap anyway in those countries. Uh -huh. And the spontaneity of everything, not having plans, that was actually my first experience of not having plans on a trip. Really enjoyed that. What I did not enjoy was the accommodations and how run down a lot of things were. We had to stay in a hostel where there were bunk beds and other guys, and it was really smelly because not all of them shower properly. And it was, it's Southeast Asia, right? so it's hot. Oh, yeah. It's yeah, hot, yeah. and then people sweat, and right. yeah. So, and then you have to share a shower. That was my brief experience in the backpacking. Whoa. Good experience, like some aspects of it, spontaneity, would not do it again because of the, the amount of comfort that I have to sacrifice for that level of spontaneity is not worth it. I have a good friend that also loved, I guess, I, I feel like she doesn't love it anymore because of the multiple times. So when I first met her like seven years ago, she's like, she and my ex-boyfriend were like very... Which, which ex-boyfriend, sorry? You know which ex-boyfriend. You said seven years ago, right? You don't want to dox them online. <laughs> you, you want me to dox your ex-boyfriend <laughs> online? All the girls you have data, go and read them out, post their pictures online. I don't think I want to solo travel and explore the world. There's so really? many things that I but want to do. But you said that you wanted to. I, can't, I think... I want to, but as you can see, I've never really... known himself yet. I did say that. that there's... Flippy flop. Like me, Kevin. <laughs> I'll never want to travel the world alone. I'll never want to explore the world alone. So things that are experiential for me, I need to do with other people because I'm an extrovert. And if I experience things by myself, it's like I never experienced it. If I'm going to explore the world, I would actually prefer to do it alone. I will, I will uh, accompany you. I'll be there. You're not going to be every, there. Nope. Every place nope. you're trying to explore, I'll be like, hi. Nope, you're not going to be there. Nobody <laughs> asks you to follow me. Get lost. So now let's talk a little bit more about how we budget when traveling and what is your budgeting strategy. So we've kind of established that we both have very different type of budgeting styles and both very different requirements for traveling. So how do you budget for your travel? I always budget beforehand. So I always, for I have very bad self-control as you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, I know it very well. So I always set a budget beforehand, I try to estimate, because the thing is that usually when I, whenever I travel nowadays, it's easy for me to budget because I know that I'll shop, I know that I'll spend money on food, some experiences, and I don't really have plans. Mm. So it's easy for me to budget as well, or maybe more difficult, I don't know. If I exceed my budget, I can just not do anything after that, you know, like there are no plans, so I can just chill accordingly. But I usually budget beforehand. For example, if I'm going for five days, I can be like, oh, I have a $500 budget for the five days. And then if I exceed that on day four, then day five, I'll just make sure to Oh, so you have a budget for every single day? No. It depends on, on the trip and how I want to budget it, right? So for example, mm -hmm. like Tomorrowland trip, I already have a budget written up for how much I want to spend in Tomorrowland itself. And then pre-Tomorrowland when I'm in uh, Lille for two days. And then when I'm in London for the next week, how much I estimate myself spending and I split it according to the country sometimes, split mm -hmm. it according to the day, sometimes it's just the whole trip. It really depends on the trip who I'm traveling with. So if it's mostly myself, it's much easier to control. Because I can just be like, oh, today I'll just stay in a hotel room and write scripts and work. <coughs> if I'm with friends, right, I'm like, oh, but right, we are right. here, we want to do this, we want to do that. So then it's harder. Mm. And if I travel with my boyfriend, I can just sit in a hotel room. 
that is oh, free right. because he paid for it for work. And I can just work there and then I won't waste any money. For me, when I travel, to be honest, I don't really set a budget because I just tend not to spend a lot of money even when I travel. Your trips are already mm. planned out, so it's also easy to estimate how much money you will spend, right? Because you know yeah. exactly what you're doing at every single point. Yeah, so for my recent uh, China trip, almost everything was kind of planned out, so we already know. Um, it's only when we go to a tea shop and I really want to get certain teas then, um, I'll spend money there. Otherwise, it's more or less kind of fixed. I'm not someone who likes souvenirs as well. I care more about photos and thankfully, I have a very nice camera when I take photos. Uh, it doesn't cost me anything more. I've already spent all the money on the camera and the lens. All of our money. On the camera and the lens. For and I, he hasn't even taken a photo of me yet. <laughs> Who wants to take a photo of this ugly little piece well, of shit? Oh, don't worry, Aaron. I will just take the money, I'll pay myself. Your camera. <gasps> Your camera. It's used to film our podcast talk show video. What? What do we call this? It's it's episode three, right? We still don't have a name. No, we don't have a name. Guys, help. We don't have a name. It's about who you travel with as well. Can you imagine hmm. if you're traveling with someone that really wants to try all the Michelin star restaurants? Right, yeah. And they, they want to do it together because it's a... Because, you know, you have some friends right, as well that will yeah, be like, yeah, oh no, yeah. we have to do everything together. Mm. And that's when I see that, like, friends start fighting and break, and the relationships start breaking down when they start having different budgets. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would think that's the case as well. So, hypothetical scenario. Yeah. You guys can leave your comments down below about what you think is right as well. But, so let's say you have a group of friends. When one friend is extremely, extremely budget right now. But let's say you guys are traveling somewhere like, like a grad trip. Maybe you got traveling somewhere like Australia, where mm -hmm. it's like about 800 bucks for a plane ticket, right? Yeah. And then some of your friends have started their like, oh, they're no longer physios or they're still physios, but they're working in private and they're earning a lot more money. Some of your friends have a higher earning power now and they would like to experience more things because they already paid $800 plane ticket to go to Australia. They want to go and like visit wineries, they want to pet some kangaroos, but all that costs money. So who is supposed to like give in more? Should the friend with the less money budget more for the trip? Or should the richer ones like accommodate to the one with less money. The one with money has to accommodate to the one with less money. Because the one with less money cannot physically accommodate to the one with more money. I think it's the principle of why you are going for the trip. If you're going for the trip to experience things with friends versus you are traveling with your friends to experience things. If you want to travel as a group of friends to experience things together, we have no choice but to accommodate to the person with the lowest budget or we all chip in to, to help him out, which we might do. Even for this trip as well. We all just want to chip in because... True friends right we, there. We want to have our friend there with us. Because again, friends, we're traveling there for the friends and we want to experience something new, something novel. There's no point in experiencing something novel if the friend isn't there. Therefore, we want to encourage all of our friends to make more money. But again, money's not everything. But it's just that the private sector also gives you more time and space, better mental health. So go to the private sector, it pays more. <laughs> Another hack that I use when traveling to spend less is that I use, it's called U-Trip in Singapore, but I'm sure in other countries you guys have cards that are similar. I think like Wise International. But basically travel cards that have low or zero FX fees. And usually those cards are like wallet cards, so they're not credit cards. When I budget a, for myself, the trip, I just top up the budget that I gave myself. It's kind of like the debit card where once if on the fourth day of my five day trip, I'm like, I, I have only $20 left, then I'm like, you know what? <laughs> Tomorrow, I'm just gonna eat street food, McDonald's, whatever, it depends on which country I'm at. So I think it's a very good trick for me to not overspend. I physically don't have any more money in, inside. Yes, you can always top up your card, but I think having that barrier makes it much easier to um, keep my finances in check. Mm. <clears throat> and you are like a Singapore credit card wizard. So when would you use like the debit travel cards and when would you use credit cards to collect miles? There are like mile lines the good. I guess I'm just one of the few people that credit card hack and share my journey on the internet. <laughs> so follow us on TikTok for more tips if you would like. But um, uh, yeah. the main reason why I... So I do use credit cards, but I only use one specific card. But the things that I don't know if you guys have anything similar. In your other, country? Yeah. In country? Yeah. So <laughs> in general, that is a special thing that we have in Singapore. Comment down below if you guys have something similar in your country so that if anyone else watching from your country can help each other. 
since according to our analytics, most of you guys are American, so maybe some Americans, please leave your tips down below. So we have this card called the Amaze card that you can link to a credit card where they give you credit card rewards. And the credit card reward that I opt for is Miles. So I link that card with my Mal card. So in Singapore, we have this card called the Amaze card. It's a low FX card as well, but instead of it being a wallet card like most cards, what it does is that when you tap your card, for example, if something costs like 5 USD in the card itself, it will convert the USD into an SGD transaction and it will charge $7 Singapore dollars to the credit card linked to the Amaze card. So it brings down the FX rate? Yeah. Right. And you still get your credit card mile? Yes. It's like a win-win. It's a win-win, oh, but cool. the mm. FX rate is sometimes higher, like the, like the, the spread that they earn or whatever right, it yeah. is. It's higher than low FX, the actual travel cards like U-Trip or Wise and things like that, or mm. Revolut. So it's a little bit higher sometimes. I mean, it fluctuates a little bit. Many people's experience is that it ranges up and down. But the thing is that in Singapore, the card that is able to connect with that card has a $1,000 a cap, so I only use that for the first thousand dollar, and then I move on to my travel cards for any expenses that is above the first thousand dollars, if any. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So that's okay, the that, that only. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. That's the yeah. literal only time I use my credit card when I'm traveling because FX rate is not worth it. The bank, in, at least in Singapore, so I'm not sure about other countries, right? But in Singapore, the bank FX rates are insane. The miles are not worth the fees that you pay for it. If you want to mile hack in your country, you need to figure out how much a mile is worth depending on the airline that you choose, right? So for us at Singapore Airlines, and you, you need to do calculations or if there is someone in your country that is a mile hacking expert, hmm. they might have already done the calculations for you for specific airlines, how much a mile is worth. And that's when you decide whether you want to pay fees for it or not. Oh, interesting. I did not know that that was a very good strategy. I'm going to tell my fiancé that so that we can... How do you not know? You never watch... You, you don't watch my videos? Well, you see, I see your face every single day. When I see your face on TikTok, I kind of scroll away. I'm not giving you any more tips. <clears throat> so now that you're going to get your fiancé to use these cards, right? Mm -hmm. And you'll probably also apply it in your own life. Yeah. Some ways to earn extra miles would be like paying for your friends first. So how I earn extra miles while I'm on the trip. So the thing is that spending is spending and you should never use mile hacking as a reason to spend, right? But if you are already going to be spending, you want to be stretching your dollar, right? So how I mile hack or get the most out of my expenses would be like if I'm on a trip with my friends, I could buy stuff back from my friends and earn credit card miles from there. Especially when you have friends that are willing to pay the FX rates because they want something that they can't get in Singapore and it's still much cheaper after the FX rate. So for example, if, if you're going to Korea, and there's a lot of skincare products and it's much cheaper there. Even if you pay your bank credit card FX rates, it's still cheaper than buying in Singapore, for example. So your friends might be willing to pay the FX rate, cover the FX rates, and then you get the mouse, but you bring that back for them for free. So it's a win-win. Your friend is giving you the mouse, you're helping him bring it back. Yeah, so it's, it's, a win -win. it's totally a, a win-win. Yeah. yeah, it makes so much sense. Yeah, so do that. Another, another thing is you can always pay for stuff first. When traveling with your friends, pay for the meal first. Uh, and then yeah. another way is also pre-travel. You'll be the one that book accommodations and flights. I'm not too lazy to do that. Yeah, but I mean, depending on your lifestyle, <clears throat> maybe for you, if you don't travel that much, cashback could be better for you as well. Oh, the Amaze card works with cashback cards as well. And mm. when you got, if you guys are overseas, like honestly, it really depends on the value of a mile. So if... For every dollar you spend, your mile is worth a lot less, then you might as well get cash back. That so really, you really gotta do the math and really figure out which is better for you. But if you're too lazy, just pick one. It's better than not doing anything because you're still at least stretching a dollar a little bit, even yeah. if it's not the most <clears> optimized. <throat> but if you have absolutely no self-control, do not apply for a credit card. Never uh, get into credit card debt. Oh yeah, never get into credit card debt. It's cr it's it's the fees are so high. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Especially you Americans, because that's where mm, the data mm. comes from. Credit card debt is at all time high now. I saw that as well, which surprised me because, uh, to be honest, in Sing in Singapore at least, at least the people that I know, no one has credit know, card debt. I know, I know people with credit card debt. Oh, you do. Don't know if the credit card debt is still there, but yes, people actually do. I think it's because we grew up in a family where we were taught to not get a credit card debt. Yeah, but maybe that's why. I think some people they don't know as much, right? Financial literacy is not taught. Financial education is not taught in school, so. And 
with regards to financial education and things like that, basically about keeping yourself safe, right? Yeah. Travel insurance. What do you think about travel insurance? Is it a must or want or need or maybe have? In my opinion, travel insurance is already so cheap. Might as well get it. I believe that too. To be honest, most insurance that just covers insurance, mm -hmm. because there's insurance policies that covers investments as well, I think those are not the best. Mm. But insurance that just covers insurance, like uh, travel insurance, health insurance, uh, personal accident, all these generally are quite cheap and you should always have it because you mm. never really know what's going to happen. Losing my luggage is my biggest fear when traveling. I've never lost my luggage before, but it's a huge fear. Mm. At least travel insurance kind of makes up for it. There was one trip last year when my boyfriend lost his luggage. Oh no, his luggage was delayed. To him, that was a big win. He was there for a work trip. So on the first day there, we basically managed to buy a bunch of stuff. And the rest of the days, I was helping him shop as well. But everything is covered. He basically got a whole new wardrobe for free for the inconvenience. But that's a luggage that's delayed. A luggage that's lost. That'll be quite yeah. devastating, yeah, yeah. yeah. So depending on what you have in your luggage, you better get an expensive coverage. Okay, I don't even have luxury bags. I only have one. Hmm. But aside from that one, which I don't bring when I travel, I don't bring like anything expensive with me mm. when I travel. And if you are from Singapore and would like to buy some travel insurance, uh, we will link some below just in case you need it. We have a family travel insurance that our parents pay for. It's a yearly <laughs> travel insurance, so we don't have to buy it every single time we travel. But if you guys are someone that does not buy travel insurance when traveling and want to start now, you can use the links below. Lastly, when it comes to all you little nerds left on here that trade and invest, how do you manage your trading and investing when overseas? So I think, first of all, you need an internet connection. Like, that's number one. Number two, use the brokerage that has very good uh, mobile apps. So I need to be able to access my trade, easily see it, and then execute. Which is why I like my trips to be really planned, because I can just figure out when I have some free time. Like, let's say we have a one-hour train journey. I know that's the time I can execute my trades. I know that's the time I can look at the stock market. I know that's when I, I can execute. But I think if you are a day trader, it's horrible to do that while traveling. Don't even try. Mm. Uh, it, it will ruin your trip or you'll ruin your trade. Either one. <laughs> Something will be ruined, right? But if you're a swing trader like Not me... Not day trade because it will ruin your trip or your trade. Oh, that's good. So, swing trade. Yes, absolutely. I do swing trades when I travel as well. I need to know exactly when's my take profit, where's my stop loss, and what are the adjustments. I write it down first and I see the notes, see the charts. If it matches, make the trade, take out the trade, modify the trade and then get about my day. So it's really, really very precise. Okay, cool. I think that is the last thing on my list of questions. Thanks for watching, guys. Again, please help us come up with a name for <laughs> this unscripted talk show thing or what a thingamajig, whatever it is. Um, whatever this is. Yep, leave a comment, like, subscribe if you would like to watch our next few episodes. And leave us topic suggestions as well. Bye!